Hi guys, welcome back to The Social Tune and a brand new episode of Record Roundup. Yes, we're actually doing handheld freeform record roundups now, similar to the retrospective ramble series, and uh, this is basically just so I can catch up with the huge amount of albums that I missed talking about in uh, 2018. There are a lot to get to, and I'm going to be tackling them 10 at a time in these videos. So if I sometimes lose a trail of thought, or if I occasionally don't quite know how to phrase something, I hope you'll bear with me. I'll try to edit out most of the hesitation. But with all that said, time to start off with an album that so many of you requested for a long time, but I was extremely late to actually get to. Uchis is, of course, one of those artists that I had heard about. I'd seen her show up here and there on different people's projects, and for the most part, she seemed fine, but she didn't really stand out to me. I kind of saw her in the vein of an artist like Kelani, who is fine, and I like fine in other people's songs, but I just don't personally look out for her own music, if that makes sense. However, so many people kept requesting this album, and so many critics were praising it, so I thought, well, there must be something here, right? And it turns out, there definitely is. I had a couple of people tell me that this was an album where individual songs really stuck with them over time, and I really do think that is this album's hidden strength because it is easily one of the catchiest and most memorable pop albums that I have heard all year. True, I will say that every single time I look at the cover, I'm reminded of uh, Lord's Melodrama last year. Granted, it's not quite as good or as complex as that album. But with that said, you might be surprised by some of the directions that Caliucci's decides to take both the sounds and the content of this album too. And even though on first listen, you might just mistake this for a generic, sex-filled pop album. There's actually a surprising amount of nuance and complexity to some of these lyrics, and especially some of these melodies. Seriously, this album tries way more than your average pop album, and it makes for some incredibly catchy and memorable songs. And that's not even touching on the fact that so many of these songs seem to toe a line between Kaliuchi's being in full control of her sexuality, and yet still letting some insecurities slip in here and there, but never enough for her to not be an impact powering figure on this album. Heck, on most of these songs, even when she does play the victim, it's mostly challenging the lover that she's with to try harder, to go for broke more often, because she will respond to it in kind. So yeah, this really is a terrific pop album with so many memorable hooks that I can easily come back to. In many ways, it kind of reminds me of Dua Lipa's album last year, but even more refined and more experimental. And with the Spanish-touched instrumentation and over atmosphere to everything here, this is an album that I can definitely appreciate and easily give a solid 8 out of 10 to. Yeah, I definitely wasn't expecting it, but I'm really glad that I checked out this album. It's definitely worth your time. Again, it may catch you off guard the first time you hear it, it may not sound like anything all that revolutionary or new, but if you take the time to pick apart the details, then trust me, you'll see just how special this is. <laughs> So, learning my lesson from the last video, I am now going to stop trying to film vertically because that's more of a retrospective rambles thing and it doesn't really work when I'm trying to talk more seriously about a full album. But with that said, let's talk about this new album by Sophie that everybody was just losing their minds over. Now Sophie, for those of you who don't know, probably first came into prominence when she collaborated with Charlie XCX a couple of years ago. It was kind of the turning point for a lot of people in taking Charlie more seriously as a pop artist outside of the mainstream, and I will say that that project does still hold up to this day. But Sophie herself is kind of a different entity to Charlie. She is much more experimental, she can be much more abrasive, and she can be a little bit harder to to get into for a lot of new fans. But as someone who was kind 
kind of looking for more experimental and abrasive electronic music, I decided to check this out, especially because everybody was going so nuts over it. And overall, I can definitely see the appeal of this. It's loud, it's abrasive, oftentimes it can almost be so overwhelming that you really don't know what to make of it. I remember the first time I ever listened to this album, I was just getting on board a plane and sitting uh, on the tarmac waiting for the plane to take off, I barely noticed the time passing because this album was so damn distracting. From the repetitive hypnotic rhythms that seem to build in crescendo, to the blasts of noise that occasionally come out of nowhere and can really catch you off guard, to the very sharp tones that will turn off your average mainstream listener, almost guaranteed. Heck, even if you're a fan of electronic music, I can't say that you will necessarily enjoy this album. And with all of that in mind, I would say that it's probably Sophie's best fully formed project to date. Now with that said, would I go so far as to call it a great album? No, not quite. I think that some of the abrasiveness can occasionally feel a little bit forced, especially because it can occasionally take away from just how damn beautiful this album can occasionally be. And I think that personally, if she decided to focus more on the beauty rather than the abrasiveness, it would have made for a bit more of a balance. I mean, obviously when you look at the title, you do get the impression that she wanted to show something like that. The beauty of the pearl, but with the oil tarnishing it and making it ugly and difficult to make out. However, in my opinion, it would have made a bit more sense narratively if we got a few more moments where the instrumentation was allowed to just be lush and gorgeous, especially near the beginning of this album. Still, with that said, it is a really good project and I can definitely see a lot of people really getting into this. Really strong 7 out of 10. Definitely take the time to check this out. Now I hit the FBO with duffels in my hands. I did half a Zan, 13 hours till I land. Had me out like a light, ay, like a light, ay, like a light, ay. Slept through the flight, ay, not for the night. So as we speak, Sicko Mode is still making its rounds in the Billboard Top 20. And look, while the song has somewhat grown on me for its experimentation, I'm still not sure if I'm completely sold on it just yet, even though I definitely wouldn't say it's the worst song off of this album like many people have decided to do. But that's possibly because even though Astro World has been praised to hell and back by tons of music critics, I just don't get the appeal of it. So many people when talking about this album were comparing it to the hip hop classics of this decade. With some people even comparing its new use of sound to 808s and Heartbreaks by Kanye West. And let me be blunt, in some ways I can definitely appreciate this album. It is ambitious, it is widespread, it does go for some definite experimentation, especially when using autotune and melody. However, my main problem with Travis Scott has always been the same from the very beginning. That being that he can occasionally be a really visceral performer, but often just chooses to vibe out, rely on the autotune, and become incredibly lazy. And unfortunately, on a lot of these songs, he does default to that. Which wouldn't be as big a problem if it weren't the fact that none of the guest stars really try all that hard either, or at least it doesn't feel like it. And look, not every single experiment on this album works, let's not give Travis Scott too much credit here. I know I'm gonna be in the minority on that, his last two albums for me have just been eh, and for me, this is slightly more interesting, but with more missteps than those albums. It takes more risks, but it also doesn't pay off nearly as much as a lot of people would have you think. So yeah, unfortunately, I'm not really a big fan of Astro World. It might be some people's hip hop album of the year, but for me, it's just a strong five out of 10. Sorry. me returning to my old stomping grounds. Hey, we haven't filmed here in a while, and certainly not at this angle. Anyway, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, Youngblood is 5 Seconds of Summer's best album to date. I still remember my excitement when the single came out, and while it did take a little bit of time to really grow on me, it's quickly become one of my favorite hit songs of this year. It's just got a propulsive pop edge that so much of pop music hasn't had in the past couple of years. And I'll also say that it's easily my favorite single of theirs that I can love unironically. But with that said, the album itself actually kind of caught me off guard. Sure, it is a little bit long, 
song and you could have cut some of these songs and it would honestly have been better for it. But the songs we do get are incredibly catchy. It's amazing how well this album sticks with you. And while I will say their songwriting has never really impressed me, they don't quite fall into as many pits as they have on previous albums. There is no line here as bad as American Apparel Underwear and definitely no song on here as bad as Amnesia. Now on the flip side, I wouldn't quite say this album quite reaches the highs of some of their previous albums. You're not going to get a song in here as good as Jet Black Heart after all. However, there are a couple that come close. I actually found myself really loving the propulsive edge of Babylon and the way it breaks down after that incredible voice distortion on the hook. Not to mention a more refined ballad like Ghost of You, which honestly has some pathos to it. And yeah, in a lot of ways it's nothing special and again, it could have been streamlined and been better for it. But with that said, for as overblown as it can be, the stuff that works really does work well. And so I have no problem at all giving it a strong 7 out of 10. Yeah, it might be a little bit surprising for some of you guys out there, but for 5 Seconds of Summer fans, I'm sure you'll be delighted. And if you're not, hold your rage for a moment. Oh, it's Saturday night. Yeah. I pray for the wicked on the weekend. Mama, can I get another amen? Oh, 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 it's Saturday night. Yay. We have another solo project by Brendan Urie. I mean, a fully fledged project by the entire band that is Panic at the Disco. <sighs> Look, I mentioned this in my q and I'm not really a fan of Panic at the Disco. And while I will say that High Hopes isn't exactly a bad song, it can be a tad annoying. And unfortunately, that's what I would say about this album as a whole. It's not bad, but the ideas presented here have all been done before better on previous Panic at the Disco albums. And I will say, as someone who has taken the time to check out their entire discography, while I haven't been a huge fan of it, I would easily say that this is their worst and blandest album to date. Many people have said that this album is swinging for the fences and that's why they can cut it some slack. But the problem is, being bombastic isn't necessarily the same thing as swinging for the fences. And it seems that Brendan Yuri has given up all pretense and has just decided to make every single song Emperor's New Clothes again and again and again. And look, the more I listen to that song and other cuts off of their last album like Hallelujah, the more I realize that it just doesn't age all that well. Now look, does the album have energy and is is Brendan Urie's voice still amazing? Yes, of course. But unfortunately, that's not enough to really have me coming back to the album, and the hooks themselves aren't actually that memorable. I mean, this album's only real technique to make you remember it is by hammering in its songs with force and propulsion that honestly doesn't feel refined because there's no break from it. Unlike Five Seconds of Summer, where there's at least more of a balance. If every single song was as propulsive as Youngblood, then you wouldn't really feel the impact of anything off of the album. And really, that's what I'd say about this album as a whole. It keeps trying to hit you, but you feel no impact from it. And so, I'm just gonna have to give it a light 5 out of 10. Sorry, Panic at the Disco fans, I know you're not gonna be a fan of this, but I tried to like this and I just can't. Sorry. So this is going to be the first album in these videos that I've actually talked about before, as it ended up making my mid-year list for the best albums of 2018. Now some of you may remember that I placed it at number 4 when I talked about it before, and while it's kind of faded on me a tiny bit, it's still amazing for all the reasons that I named in that video, and more. First off, it's an incredibly memorable and detailed folk album, with lyrics that dive into, well a weird thing. This whole album is basically from the perspective of Mother Earth and nature as an entity, where we as a species are so damn bad for it and abuse it for everything it's worth, even though we claim that we love it. I mean, we call it things like Mother Nature after all. We have to have some kind of connection to it, right? And yet, we just keep taking and taking and taking from it, and yet somehow, all of that never comes across as preachy. In fact, the surprising thing is just how well she manages to humanize the Earth, manages to make you actually feel something for it as a character. And look, 
look, I may be completely wrong. This album might be about something completely different, because the poetry on it is admittedly pretty dense. But it's dense in the best possible way, the kind of poetry that sounds wonderful, even if you don't know what it's talking about. And ultimately, while I'm not going to say it's quite up there with her collaboration with Katie Lang and Laura Veers back in 2016, it's definitely one of the best albums of the year, getting a 9 out of 10 from me. This album may not be for everyone, but if you have the time and the patience to really dig into the lyrics and an appreciation for great folk music and amazing hooks, then you will definitely find something to like in this project. guys told me to check this out without knowing anything at all about the band going into them. Seriously, whoever you are, I really can't remember who, you specifically told me to go into this with absolutely no knowledge of the band beforehand. And honestly, that's kind of an interesting way to approach this album. Because if you were to actually research Rolo Tomasi beforehand, you may see them as one of the weirdest and most experimental and abrasive groups out right now. And it's definitely not a sound that's for everyone. It's very, very far from accessible. Which is why, if you're familiar with their sound and you dive into this album, it kind of takes you off guard because this is easily their catchiest and most accessible and pop-friendly album to date. Sure, there are a couple of moments that slip back into that weird abrasiveness, but for the most part, this album is just a fun, catchy time. I'm not gonna say you would hear this on pop radio, or that you'd confuse it with, say, a Five Seconds of Summer song, but it's a weird blend of genres that somehow still has a pop focus, much like 21 Pilots' blurry face back in 2015. Now, I will say, is it anywhere near as catchy or as memorable as that album? Unfortunately not. While I will say that it is fun to listen to, and it is catchy, I'm not gonna say a lot of these hooks are really really gonna stick with me, as the writing can occasionally feel just a little bit undercooked when compared to some of their previous projects. Although to be fair, if you go back through their discography, I've never really been a fan of Rolo Tomasi's songwriting. But either way, this is a very interesting group, and I would say that for new listeners, this is a very good inroad into their music, as it kind of eases them in into the weirdness that is this band. So I'll give this a solid 7 out of 10. That seems fair. Oh boy, if there was one project that I was not looking forward to talking about, it was this one. Don't get me wrong, I've never hated Mac Miller as much as some critics. I would honestly say that he has some qualities that I like. He can be chill, his choice in instrumentals is usually excellent, and even though his rapping style can occasionally really bore me, he can occasionally be funny, or at the very least charming. After all, his collaboration with Ariana Grande on The Way in 2013 is still a song that I can return to fondly. And of course, you have the loaded implications that this was his final album before his unfortunate death after a drug overdose just a couple of months ago. And much like Linkin Park's final album before Chester Bennington committed suicide, unfortunately, much as the fans may connect with this, I think it's kind of bland. Some of the instrumentals are fine, but some of them are just terrible. Some of the lyrics are chill and cool in a laid-back fun sense, but they do meander, and it's kind of hard to find a point from time to time. Heck, on a bad day, I might even compare it to some of the best of XXXTentacion's music. I mean, it's not as reprehensible, definitely not in the attitude that he presents, but it does meander and feel a little bit aimless in the same sort of way, with not much structure to these songs. So yeah, if you're just looking for chilled music to get stoned to, you would probably like this just fine, but for me, it's just not cutting it. I need some more meat in my music, so light 5 out of 10. Sorry guys, I'm not really one of the cool kids, I guess. I 
so let's finally talk about one of the most requested albums that I got all of this year. And honestly, I'm not too sure how to feel about this. Post Malone may have started out as just being that guy who made White Iverson, a song that I really dislike, but not nearly as much as some other critics, but it was only after that that I started looking more into his online personality and grew to like him a little bit more. Of course, most of that was squandered after a really terrible interview where he basically said that you shouldn't go to rap music if you want deep music, which is just ridiculous if you actually are a fan of hip hop and know just how personal and intimate it can get. But fuck it, putting all of that aside, his success over the past year has been kind of astonishing. Obviously, Stoney was pretty successful, but I really wasn't a big fan of that album, especially not some of the biggest hits off of it like I Fall Apart. But Congratulations was decent, and Rockstar was the first time I could honestly say I really liked a Post Malone song, specifically for the really, really excellent production. And following that up with Psycho with Ty Dolla Sign, which was also a really good song, I was actually kind of intrigued going into Beer Bongs and Bentleys, an album that had been delayed by several months, but finally arrived and then broke a ton of records with how successful it was. And it's actually pretty good. Don't get me wrong, Beer Bongs and Bentleys isn't exactly a really good album, but it's got a formula that it does well, and honestly it's a formula that does somewhat appeal to me. Not to mention it does help that so many of these songs are incredibly catchy. And really, that is this album's hidden strength, the fact that so many of these songs could be hits, and many of the ones that were most eligible were actually made into hits. You won't find as many albums this year with as many memorable hooks, and the production is just very enough for it not to feel samey all the way through. However, I will say that as a critic, I do have one big problem with this album, and that's the lyrics. When the songwriting isn't just incompetent with terrible lines like Ty Dolla Sign's about Chain So Stanky on Psycho, you have songs where he's just moaning about his fame and his riches, and it's just not relatable. After all, rappers do like to moan about fame all the time, that's fine, but Post Malone seems to really see it as a burden, and very rarely seems to appreciate the success that it has given him. Even though if you look at him in real life, he doesn't seem to regret that at all. It really does feel like a put-on. But ultimately, while I am conflicted on this album, I will say that I did enjoy it. It may be a little bit overlong, I do wish that some of these songs had been cut, but the catchiness and the good production does keep me coming back to it, so I'm gonna give it a solid 6 out of 10. It may not be my top album of the year by any stretch, but I can say it's a big improvement since Stoney, so I gotta give him that at least. You know what? All the shots. I brought the vibe like I told you before. Man, I done lots. You know what? I pulled the shots. I was a young boss, learned from the best night. I pulled the shots. And for our final album on the docket for the day, let's talk about Godfather 2 by Wiley. Now some of you may remember me talking about Wiley before when I talked about the prequel to this album, Godfather. And if you do remember that review, you might remember me being very, very positive. I gave the album an 8 out of 10, and I really did love how catchy and bombastic and energetic it was. Sure, the album could feel a little bit samey all the way through, but it had incredible hooks, the energy was infectious, and Wiley was just a fantastic MC. So as you can imagine, I was pretty excited when I heard that there was a sequel to such a project. Unfortunately, I really don't think it's as good. Like, at all. The problem is actually pretty plain to see right out the gate. You see, on Godfather, there were one or two songs where Wiley was trying to be a bit more of a romantic, going for more of a pop rap spin on the grime that got him to where he was. But on that album, it felt more like a fusion of genres, and while I wasn't a huge fan of it, it felt a little bit more cohesive. Whereas here, I'm sorry, it just feels like pure pop. And unfortunately, it's really not one that flatters him. The hooks aren't as catchy, the energy is not there in the same way, and frankly, the content just bores me. And the thing that makes it worse is that Wiley doesn't exactly feel comfortable in this lane. This is a rapper who I really respected on the first of these projects, but on this one, he's just not convincing at all. So unfortunately, I don't really have much to say on this album. It's a disappointment on pretty much every front. And while Wiley himself is a good enough rapper 
to make it salvageable. With one or two exceptions, I don't ever want to go back to this. So solid five out of 10. And those were our records for today. As you can tell, I filmed these over the course of a couple of days in several different locations. But like I said, it's a free form format and I'm just filming whenever I have the time. Hope you guys don't hate this format. Leave your feedback on it in the comments below, as well as any more albums that you'd like me to check out before the end of the year. See you in the next record roundup. And until then, I'm Finn and this is The Social Tunes signing off.